Today at The Hague Security Delta, representatives from European governments, transport, border control, police and the Red Cross will be discussing security issues surrounding the migrant crisis of 2015 in Europe by playing simulation games. The program today is centered on games and exercises that encourage knowledge sharing. The games have been designed by Dutch research organization TNO. After a short round of introductions, the participants are introduced to the first game, the chain game. The object of the game is to facilitate the production of a popular children's toy, the Mutana Banana. The chain game is an introductory game designed to encourage people to interact while remaining attuned to thinking strategically. Players are keenly observed during the game and observations are recorded. Multiple themes are explored in the game, cooperation, transparency and motivation. We ask participants to reflect on these themes and their own values. First of all, all partners succeeded in, uh, in meeting their mission or their goal in raising their stock value of their own company, so it was successful. It could have been more successful even if uh, we would have partnered more uh, together than, than we actually did. Well, I, I was confirmed of something, which is that it seems like um, a lot of people tend to forget the humanity of the people that we're actually trying to work for and are treating refugees and considering them to be products in a intrinsically capitalist system. I think it always transfers well to, to show you that uh, cooperation in many cases is more successful than isolated decisions and that if you're transparent and if you, if you find uh, a common goal uh, then uh, you will be more efficient, effective uh, and successful that way. Today's knowledge sharing workshop is organized by the European Commission Consortium SOURCE. Peter Burgess, the scientific coordinator of SOURCE, gives a brief history of how society deals with security in Europe. Cold War security, for those of you old enough to uh, remember, and now I'm showing my age, was far more than today a story of a, a bipolar relationship. Us and them, the Western Allies and the Soviet Union. It was really very difficult throughout the Cold War period to use the word security without the reference going immediately to some sort of bipolar logic. Peter explains that this bipolar thinking began to change at the end of the Cold War, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. The concept of security was somehow liberated. Suddenly, on a horizontal level, you could uh, multiply different kinds of security. Financial security, health security, religious security, cyber security, etc. It could go on and on. While security took on different forms, new types of threats to society became much more apparent. All these threats, cyber, terrorism, pandemic, food, financial, they don't respect the bipolar logic. They don't respect national borders, international borders. They don't respect this logic of us and them. All those threats that I just mentioned, they're already here. This is why different stakeholders of societal security in Europe are here today to share knowledge by simulating the migration crisis of 2015 in a game. They are going to play a game loosely based on the board game Risk. The setting is similar to that of the migrant situation in Austria in 2015 when 10,000 migrants arrived in the capital Vienna by train. Other than the starting scenario and a few basic parameters, the game does not have many okay. rules. So there are not many rules in it. The knowledge in the rules do come from you. Because the game has little structure and rules, it seems like there is a lot of talking going on, but not many events unfolding. 
It seems to stagnate. There is a lot of discussion and communication between players, discussions that often lead in the same direction. The more rounds that are played, the more realistic the game seems to a real-life crisis. The observers are surprised at the results. So it was very informative, it was very interesting. I think it worked uh, to the satisfaction of, of everybody. And there were a few surprises. Uh, one surprise was how much um, emotion played in. We who thought that it was uh, really a matter of calculation and rational decision making found out that it actually has a lot to do with how people feel and how pe what people value and what they get excited about and what they get angry about. And uh, that came out also across the national cultures. The Austrians react to things in one way and the French react to things another way. And these things are all, always, or often at least, uh, based on um, values and the way, the passions we have about our values. Uh, the first thing that uh, was clear uh, from the first, be from the very beginning, with the first game, was that uh, uh, this linguistic part <laughs> plays a big role. So I, um, uh, some of the participants just didn't get involved in the first day game because they, because of the technical aspect of the game, it was quite difficult to understand. It was quite difficult to enter the game, but because also of the uh, linguistic issue, they just were not fluent enough in English to feel comfortable to to take part in the discussion. So we had like two or maybe three actors completely dominating the, um, the table and uh, basically saying others what they should do uh, within their group but also with the other group. One of the goals of the game is that participants gain knowledge about the factors of decision making that other parties have and therefore understand that communicating such factors more openly in the future can be beneficial. One of the things we've learned that uh, it might be a good idea to share your values. And it was said, well, the Red Cross, I'm working for the Red Cross, uh, it's uh, one of the organizations that is very explicit about uh, their values. Um, and, uh, uh, well, you can try to be more explicit uh, as an organization in times of a crisis so you can understand each other and your position. And uh, again, it's uh, always uh, good to share your um, uh, goals as well uh, in this specific case. And um, the third thing what I've learned is it's very good to share your limitations as an organization as well. So you can find a solution maybe together or accept that uh, it, uh, it's not possible to do it uh, for 100%. Helpful uh, working with the other groups together. The communication, learn the communication, learn the problems of the Red Cross, of, of railway, police. It's, it's very border police. It's very uh, helpful to train this communication. While some results are predictable, playing them out in such a simulation game has powerful effects for learning. Rudy from TNO explains. I think in any case where there is complex decision making and multi-actor stake, stakeholders, that there's a much more effective and powerful way to convey a message to the audience in the form of a game. Uh, so instead of saying people, uh, this is what you should change about your logistical chain, um, we let them play a game. And afterwards, we ask them, what are your experiences? Um, could you apply this to your own organization? And they generate the ideas themselves. And I think this is the most powerful way of uh, convincing someone, uh, them telling you what they want to change.